Fertility Q&A. I am a rapid fire answering some of your top fertility questions. Hey friends, I am Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I am on YouTube to educate you about your fertility and it is National Infertility Awareness Week. This is a week to bring education and break the stigma of infertility. And I asked if you guys had any fertility questions on my Instagram and you had quite a few. And so I am taking this week to YouTube to answer a bunch of your questions because the reality is there's so much we don't know and understand about our bodies and I wanna help break the facts down to you. If you like what you're hearing, please subscribe and stick around. I would love to have you as part of this community as we learn and grow together. Okay, let's jump in. When do you count the first day of your period? When it's the brown and red discharge, usually three to four days, or when you actually bleed red blood? Does this affect ovulation days? Great question. Day number one of your period is the first day of full flow. That spotting stuff is not the first day of full flow. Also, about one to two days of spotting is considered normal. If you're really consistently having three to four days of spotting, you might want to track your ovulation and see if you have a luteal phase defect or a short luteal phase. Most of us would consider abnormal spotting in the luteal phase to possibly mean that it may be harder for you to get pregnant. And I like to treat these with a small amount of ovulation induction medicine. Personally, that's my preference. Some other people will give some progesterone. That's not a wrong answer either, but I like to go to the root cause and not just put a Band-Aid on it. But first day of your cycle, first day of full flow, that's day one. That is what you go by to count for your entire cycle and for the day that you ovulate. Three IVF kits, two frozen embryos. How long to keep them before letting them go? No plans for more kids. I love this question. So here's how I think about the decision to discard your frozen embryos. Number one, you should keep them as long as you would ever possibly add a child to your family, even if the worst thing imaginable happened. Cancer, accidents, death. If everybody in your family died, if both your children died, whatever the situation is, would you ever consider having a new child? Because if the answer is yes, you pay the money because there will come a time where that is not a feasible option for you anymore. When that time is passed, then it's time to think about what to do with them. What are all the options? Number one, you can just keep on paying. You can pay the annual storage. I like to say it's the cheapest rent in Austin and they could always get passed on to one of your kids if they had infertility. That's something we're now seeing and considering. Number two, you can donate them. Issues with donating embryos is that you might feel like it's weird having a true genetic child out there, a true sibling to your children, but it is a very altruistic thing you can do to help people. Number three, you can donate them to research. There's different research being done on embryos and that can help us. Number four, get rid of them. And this is what most people do. My thought and how I think of this is that naturally what happens, a group of eggs comes out of the vault, one egg would be chosen to ovulate, the rest of them would die, next month another group of eggs. In IVF, we just get all those eggs to grow, take them out of your body, fertilize them in the lab. So to me, discarding embryos is like returning to nature where many of them would have died. And so I don't personally have a problem with it. And that's how I like to frame it to patients. If you're just reverting to nature, by discarding the embryos that didn't make it into children, just like your body discards eggs. I understand that's ethically complex and some people don't feel comfortable with that. You can also choose to transfer them. That is option number five. You can say, hey, we'll transfer them. There is something called a compassionate transfer, which a lot of us don't necessarily do, but it's where you put an embryo inside the body at a time when it cannot implant, such as there's no progesterone around. To me, that is a procedure and done when you should probably just discard them because we're not giving them a real chance. But to some people, that's the decision that makes them feel better. And there's no right or wrong answer. There's no right or wrong. It's whatever works for you. 35 years to speak. Oh, 35 years going to speak to a doctor about freezing my eggs. How should I prepare? Love it. So proud of you. Okay. Number one is you want to understand the egg freezing process. So goal number one is just to get more information so you can understand what the process is going to be like you're going to understand what they're gonna test you. They're gonna to wanna to test your antral follicle count, which is an ultrasound and an AMH, which is anti-malarian hormone. These tests are gonna give the clinic or the doctor an idea of how many eggs to expect. Once they have that information, they'll be able to make a plan for you and a protocol. And that's gonna answer some of your secondary questions, which is what does the timeline look like? I think other important questions is, Based on my goal of XX kids at XX time, how many eggs do you think I should freeze? Your doctor should be able to walk you through a mathematical equation to help you get to that number. Also, you want to ask, 
hey, what is it like in this clinic? What hours of the day do you do monitoring? Who does the monitoring? Is it doctors? Is it nurses? Is it sonographers? How do I get my results? Is there a portal, a phone call, an email? What is the way of communication? Who's going to do my egg retrieval? Is it going to be my doctor or doctor of the day? Where's the procedure going to be done? Is there an offsite lab or surgery center? Is it in the office? Is it anesthesia? What are the risks of the procedure? Egg retrievals are low risk, but they're not no risk. And so you want to understand the entire process. And then what does it look like if you need or choose to do a second round? Is it financially more advantageous to pay for them up front? What does that look like? How fast can you get into it? Those are all great questions to ask. Is there anything you can do in the two week wait to optimize your chances of conceiving? I have a whole video on the two week wait because I just think most people don't understand it. I so that's been very popular. Go watch that one. But I also think that the two week wait is a time of high stress. So in my mind, anything you can do to lower your stress is going to be helpful. Figure out what help you need around the house. Ask for time. Don't overload your schedule because you're going to be anxious. Share with people, go to therapy, journal, exercise. I do recommend we're pregnant until proven otherwise. So don't drink alcohol. Don't eat crazy things. Don't go skydiving. But the reality is there's very little you can or can't do during this time that's going to make a difference. So putting yourself in the best mental space is going to be priority number one. Take care of you. Can a man who has never had an orgasm have biological kids? The answer is yes. What we can do is this is assisted reproductive technology. You can either have a, a stimulated ejaculation. So specifically for men who've had like spinal cord lesions, you can use a electro stimulation to induce an orgasm, therefore an ejaculate. And you can use that sample for IVF. So you have sperm. You can also do an aspiration procedure where a urologist puts a needle or cuts into the epididymis or the testes, extracts sperm out, and then we can get eggs out of the body and fertilize one sperm into each egg. So there definitely are options. Please seek help. You want to get full evaluation of the female partner and you want to understand what you're dealing with completely. AMH of 0.144 is only root IVY or IVF. Obviously, we're not giving medical advice and I don't know the full picture, other medical problems, what the sperm looks like, how old you are, how many kids you want. But the reality is anytime you get a very low AMH, you are on borrowed time. And I'm of the strong opinion you need to bring your most aggressive treatment to that that you feel comfortable with. For the vast majority of people, this is IVF. And that is because your window to conceive is getting smaller and smaller. Yes, the fewer eggs that you have as indicated by a low AMH means that you may need more cycles to get there, but each one will get you closer to that goal of an embryo to get to transfer and a higher overall chance of achieving the goal of a baby. This is limited by money mostly. So if you had insurance coverage, if you have an employer-based plan that's going to cover multiple cycles, you probably would not think twice about jumping to IVF. And that's how I always approach this with patients. Even though I know money is a real resource, we've got our four resources. We have money, time, emotional, and physical. And the reality is time is your most precious and it is running out quickly. So if there's any way you can make that happen, that is going to be the strongest recommendation. Is it the only way? It's not. Do patients get pregnant with IUI? They do, but the rates are so much lower. They're very dependent on age. Rates of miscarriage are higher. But I think it's very important to understand how you're using your last reproductive time and that you're comfortable with whatever that decision is. How many rounds of letrozole for PCOS? Next steps after six months of letrozole. So there's a few questions here. If everything else is normal, sperm is good, tubes are open, and you're using letrozole for ovulation induction, and it makes you ovulate, and you're not pregnant after six months, you have now graduated to unexplained infertility. Video on unexplained, not my most favorite thing. It's a terrible diagnosis to hear that we don't know exactly what's going on. But that is what happens when everything is normal. And once you're made to ovulate, things are normal. Your options are ovulation induction to try to super ovulate plus IUI or IVF. Strong preference for IVF because it covers and helps so many women with unexplained infertility, especially those with PCOS. You want to get a really good understanding assessment from your care team so you can make the best decision possible. Clomid versus letrozole for women with PCOS. I love this one. So Clomid is the older medication. It's been around a long time. So it's what we had and what we used. Letrozole is now drug of choice. There were really good studies done. They came back and did a head-to-head -head comparison of Clomid versus letrozole. And letrozole had a higher live birth rate for women with PCOS. So it is now the first line treatment. It is pills that you take for five days. You start them when you're on your cycle. Letrozole is an aromatase inhibitor. And so what it does is it lowers your estrogen. Therefore, your brain sends out a higher signal of FSH to help you ovulate. 
As always, I hope you learned something. You can always follow along on the As Well Learn podcast, and I hope you subscribe to the channel to learn more information. Thanks, friends. Thank you.